Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and if you are new to the show and you haven't done it already, please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button, as we are constantly adding new programming to the channel. As a matter of fact, tomorrow night we will be doing a recap show, a reaction show, I think that's what you young people say, reaction to the video essay that just premiered on Monday, Bill Cosby, Ain't Yo Daddy. And I do have to say, Pascal Robert is the one that had me change the title. It was very different. It wasn't as provocative. I won't tell you the exact words Pascal used, but he yelled at me, so I changed the title. He didn't yell at me. I made that up. But let's introduce... My homie, my dog, my co-host extraordinaire. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Uh, uh, Conan, don't tell me what to do, first of all. And there's nothing I can do about it. It's just what it's going to be. So you're going to have to fucking deal with it or all of you can eat my ass. Rather not think uh, about that. Well, a lot going on here on the technical end of things that are not making me very happy. Uh, but one thing that should make all of us happy is that today is the birthday of one mean Jean Bajlan. So if you guys haven't done it already, please wish Gene a happy birthday. Give him a shout out on Twitter. I know very quiet about his birthday. We will not be turned 40. Big 40. Officially old. The gray hair. Places that weren't gray hair before. So happy birthday, Gene. Pascal, we have this is the biggest panel we've ever had, is it not? I believe you are correct. I invited so many people that I forgot that I invited so many people. This is back to my days of being in a band and you invite everybody you know to the show, hoping that five of the 45 people you invite come out to see you. And this is one of those rare occasions that everybody returned the message. So more proof that podcasting is way better than music. I don't know if my musician slash podcasting friend would agree with me, but let's just bring in the panel. It's so long. You know our first guest as a co-host on Movie Night Extravaganza. You probably know him as a constant guest on this show. He is a personal friend. And sometimes I get the privilege to be in his band. He has a new album out. The Conan Neutron. Platonic Reversal, too, which uh, eight years in April. So been going quite a bit longer than uh, than a lot of shows and uh, still on top, if I might add. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here. Pascal, it's been a hot minute. Good to see you. Good to see you, too, Conan. I'm going to yeah. keep it uncharacteristically succinct because I know you've got a lot of people to introduce. But there's, uh, there's, thanks for having me on. It's going to be half of the show. <laughs> be brief with introductions. So usually I read your entire bio and because ain't of, no time for that. <laughs> well, bigger than that because of the fucking technical issue I have, I have all that shit saved on different and I can't do it anyway. So by the way, I thought it was a private chat. So but you read it on air. So you know live. Because that's, yeah, yeah, that's okay. I if, get it. If you were here right now, you'd probably just hug me and tell me to calm down. Uh yeah, I would. I would. Do you know what moment this is? When the battery dies on either your pickup <laughs> or your pedal. Too real. Yeah. Or there's no connection from your cable to your amp to the speaker. Where's the hum coming from? Yeah. it's That is what's going on right now. I love the band analogies. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, uh, you know, the light comes on, but no sound's coming out. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's introduce the straight man for tonight's comedy show. You may be here uh, as the writer of a book 
that is all of the scuttlebutt still in left media circles. Is she the creator of the PMC? Or is she the creator of the fuss about the PMC? I don't know. I don't care. All I know is that she came on our movie show and she's a lot of fun. Yeah, the crowd's excited. She's not even on. It's Catherine Liu. Hi. Catherine is back. Run, run, PMC. Right. Run, DMC would be a good mm-hmm. soundtrack. Run, PMC. Here's a t shirt. We should make Run, PMC t shirt. Run, PMC. Hey, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's up there with Anglo Pessimism. I think those will, those will move. Uh, Anglo Pessimism was a classic. Angle I bought two of them for my Christmas, and uh, they were very welcomed. Um, makes a great gift. Since we know where you work, did you wear? Or you have you even gone? To oh them? no, 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 no! I get well. Uh, I gave them as presents, Jason. <laughs> I don't like to wear t-shirts with words on them. It's one of my <laughs> pet peeves. <laughs> it's very foundation liberal, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, I like to say that clothing is not an inscriptable surface, but that just makes you sound like really old and grumpy. So sorry. Well, I will say, Catherine, I stopped I stopped wearing t shirts when I play live uh you know six, seven years ago. And uh, you know, I don't regret the decision at all. You mean you I just think. go commando? You just go <laughs> 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 it looks quite a bit like this, frankly. I, I got oh, oh, yeah, I'm, more I'm an yeah, This is the yeah. public. This is the persona that you get <laughs> on stage. He doesn't mind sweating through a suit jacket. Me yep. personally, at this point, I'm like, I just need to be halfway naked and then run I, back and cry. I just want to see live music again, but I can't. I, tell I, you when I would like to play it again. Yeah, that yeah. would be good. Oh. I think that we get, we have good consensus here, Catherine. Uh, I think that's too soon. For all of us here, uh, most of us are all musicians, and you're just you're kicking us in the testicles with a wide foot. Oh, it's too soon. I got Omicron, so I'm not afraid. I'm gonna lick some doorknobs. And- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got them all. Never too early for the lick I'm boosted. Right. I'm back. <laughs> well, let's bring, bring on a, the filmmaker of the crew tonight. He made a documentary some time ago about a very vibrant music scene in Athens, Georgia that birthed bands like R.E.M., the B-52s, Pylon, and more. He is filmmaker and punk rocker. I'm going to give him that. Punk rocker. Bill Cody. Oh. (laughs) Uh, Hello. And uh, first off, happy birthday, Gene. Um, and I, I have to apologize. I am wearing a pylon uh, t-shirt tonight. Uh, <laughs> apologize. I know it was. Uh, we weren't supposed to wear. Oh, you know, no logo. It's just yeah, me. it's just me. Um, it's just I would have. I would have gone commando. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just want to mention. I do have a sequel out to Athens, Georgia. That uh, mm-hmm. I was just at the Northwest Film Forum, watching them back to back, and this one's called Athens Inside Out 2, uh, Red Turns Into Blue, touches on political stuff and uh, great music, though, too. So, yeah. cool. Well, our, our next guest is a activist and musician from the industrial band, formerly on IRS Records. That was, you know IRS Records, so Conan. Yes, I do. <laughs> he is. One of the many people I invited to the show tonight. <laughs> poor, poor, poor man. Adam Shearboard of Consolidated. Thanks for having me on. Nice to be with you all. Carry on. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, it really was one of those deals where I didn't think, for whatever reason, anyone was going to want to do a show about music. I told I was recusing myself last week, uh, and I'm happy to just listen. You all uh, use the awesome space. I've never been on a podcast before. I'm happy to pretend that I'm still not on one. So uh, yeah, I can say you're doing great. Hey, we're gonna but, we're gonna bust your podcast cherry. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> great totally to be fine. with this crowd at, at that event. 
<laughs> last but not least, another good personal friend of mine. Uh, the last show I didn't do because I was throwing the headliners gear in the middle of the street in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This man calmed me down. And we talked to the wee hours of the morning as we usually do whenever I get to be on the road in either Santa Fe or Albuquerque. He is a musician that's been in several successful bands. I think he even has a platinum plaque. I'm not sure. But he doesn't have platinum plaque money. That is the, the story of all of us musicians, right? <laughs> Him and Conan are kind of actually the catalyst for this show. And their takes on the current situation with uh, a lot of people either leaving Spotify or complaining about uh, royalty rates, I think is very, very interesting. So I'm excited to see uh, Pasquale and Conan not debate, but have a conversation. So please welcome from bands in this moment, Fear Factory, Divine Heresy, and now with his wife, Devil's Throne, Pasquale Romero. What's up? Did I list list off enough bands? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's always tough when you introduce like bands that I've been affiliated with versus bands that I was a full member in or I was a session player on. It's uh, it gets to be a little, little muddy. But uh, yeah, in this moment was my biggest band. They were twice Grammy nominated. Um, did go gold, not platinum. Sorry, but, uh, Sorry. Um, get, you know, get off the show. Spotify gold though, so you know, like thirty bucks. But, uh, That's like Italian platinum, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. It's it's it was you know they they count streaming now, so so it changes the dynamic quite a bit. But but yes, a little bit of little bit of experience, but uh, not a lot of money to show for it. That's for sure. So I, I made an intro clip that I I can't sorry I can't share, but um, I do talk about the current situation with Neil Young leaving Spotify, you know, basically over Joe Rogan and COVID misinformation. But one thing a lot of people didn't know about Neil Young is that he had sold the uh, rights to about half of his music catalog to a, a major hedge fund corporation. And I read today before we went on, actually right before I pressed <laughs> upload to that that Allison Chains, surviving member in the estates of the, the two members that passed to Mike Starr and Lane Staley, just sold their rights to all of the music to two different uh, companies. There is a big run on publishing rights for older artists. Yeah, they come to snuff the rooster, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's, my quick, here's my quick question. I like the I like the Pascal. I was like, what kind of white shit is this? <laughs> <laughs> Allison James. By the way, I think that same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you are if you were thinking you, that, Pascal, you, you would not be wrong. That is what Pascal likes. You'll be surprised. You'll yeah. be surprised. Man. I went to Catholic high school in New York City. That opens you up to a lot of different musical tastes. So he's a big Van Halen, the uh, David Lee Roth. Oh, Van Halen. Hey, Van Halen's David Lee Roth, Van Halen. That's almost objectively <laughs> great if you like rock and roll. <laughs> but but quick question to the panel, since since especially the people that were involved in the music industry have definitely seen a huge change with when it comes to developing talent. And and new music, yeah, and the fact that it just doesn't happen anymore is that what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Think, how does this? And I start with you, Conan, because I know you're ready to fire off on this. How does this? Yeah. Make, how does it make you feel about the, the the idea of new music when you have so this these major corporations buying up all this older music and younger artists, if they are savvy, industry savvy. They're trying to create sound libraries 
so they can sell it off for music and television because making the great album, I actually say it in the clip, and I don't know if Adam saw it, um, it, I say that is making the great album kind of an antiquated notion for a young artist um, in the day and age of overnight fame. So Conan, I'll let you. Sure. So, I mean, I have, I have thoughts about that. More people uh, here, don't get too wordy. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, so I, I know I have thoughts about that myself, but I have the long running show Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal, which is a one on one music interview show where I talk to lots of people, uh, some of which folks would know that are watching and some of which folks would not know. But they're all important. They're all worth mentioning. And something that comes up a lot is the fact that when you put something up on the Internet, like a new music of any kind, you're not just competing with what came out that week. You're competing with all music of all time. And when I say competing, I don't mean competing in terms of money. I'm talking about in terms of attention because right now filtering is everything and we've surrendered everything to the algorithm. That's done. That that war is long since over. Like the time to like get mad about that was years ago. Uh, so by the same token, uh, you know, I'm just going to come out and say it, you know, open volley, you know, I'm not a shy guy. Uh, it was never sustainable to have or found in fairness, frankly to have the entirety of music available to you for a flat monthly fee, period, full stop. When people talk about Spotify, oh, well, you're either with Joe Rogan or with Neil Young. First of all, go to hell. Like, what are you, a kindergartner? You don't understand nuance? No, that's not true. Because if you're not on the streaming services at this point, which have replaced radio completely, myself included, as well as everything else, you're basically writing a manifesto in the woods. And I'm not saying I don't love a good manifesto. I love a good manifesto, but that's what you're doing. So when people say, hey, what streaming service should I use to replace Spotify? None of them. None of them. The entire thing, top to bottom, is not only not founded in fairness, it's founded in profiteering and sharecropping. Oh, I yield my time. Oh. <laughs> Adam, do you want to jump in on your take on the stream? That was great. That was great. Clement. That was amazing. I felt the passion. You, you, <laughs> you echo. Yeah, I echo that for 20 years, no doubt. <laughs> it, makes, uh, it makes people into uh, musical sharecroppers, and that is absolutely where it, it except that. Uh, there were organizations designed to uh, fight that for decades, and it resulted in gains uh, across society in the 20th century. Uh, with musicians, musicians don't organize. It's, uh, it's everybody for themselves in an era where uh, all of the channels are promoting uh, individual alone participation in this madness that you call all the stuff you all were just chatting about. And you can see uh, in music, because music leads, uh, the old robber barons and aristocrats are selling out when they can immediately. Bowie was probably one of the first people who got the big uh, gold watch. And that was not too long ago. It was only 15 years ago. Uh, but everybody uh, realizes that they're going to be a bluesman, a sharecropper, playing every night of their life till they die. Whether it's Elton or Carlos or uh, the rest of us, I agree with what that guy says. And I just feel like it's a, it's a great time to really... Uh, uh, improve your music, improve your mental health, and uh, and just stay away from the profiteering and the sharecropping, and enjoy uh, you know teaching and learning and finding new applications for music that have always been there, but that seem to have been drowned out simply because music was so powerful, and life produced music for a century that was so inspiring that as it started to drift away, it also indicated that life was drifting away, and that's why that music sounds better every day. Even the shit you didn't like from 50, 40, 30 years ago has increasing power as mm -hmm. power and humanity are drained out of both life and music now. So I totally agree with Conan. I just feel like uh, I'm old. I'm older than probably all of you. And uh, uh, those of us who have the least amount of time want to play and enjoy the most music. I don't know. Pascal might be older than you. Well, uh, I, I'm not. I'm older. I, I, I'm older. Are you older than Pascal, Catherine? No, you're not. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Pascal and I are about the same age. Yeah. I was. I'm 53. Yeah, I'm 56. Yeah. Oh. But you know what? Black Drum Track. 
Let them crack an Asian, don't Asian. Or the raisin. <laughs> raisin. <laughs> Put it on a doily, hang it on the wall. Speaking of beautiful young men, Pasquale, I know you have things to say about this as well because you've been actually posting some incendiary material to some about the way you view you profits and uh, i'd love to hear you chime in on this brother yeah i mean i it's it's hard for me to get it all in. i don't want to take up the entire show but um the i mean i agree with what's been said so far um i think that music as a product has been devalued to a point that we need to stop trying to compete with free and we need to figure out better ways to um, make and perform music and, and, and add value to it if we need to make money on it that, that really don't have to do with selling the music itself. Um, but um, so like I consider all my stuff, like please get it for free. I don't want you paying for it. It really doesn't matter to me. I get a check from ASCAP once a year for like six bucks and it's, it's just not worth it. Um, I've, not that I've surrendered to streaming, but it's like, if you get into my music because it's through streaming, that's fine. Um, if I, if you ever do catch me playing a show, which is almost never these days, but, um, you know, buy a shirt. But at this point, um, you know, music has just been devalued completely. Uh, but, but really the thing we have to look at is like the lens of music as a product, um, in the history of humanity, it was a product for like a, microsecond you know it it became a product in like the 1920s and then it's been a hundred years that it even existed as a thing you could really sell like before that you were the performer you sold the experience people came to see you or you were paid to be in a place to perform for people um there was no such thing as a rock star even the most famous people very few of them were wealthy by any stretch um you know, rock stars didn't even exist till the seventies, really. I mean, the sixties was like the birth of it. And then the seventies, it started peaking. We just kind of happened to be born in a time where we're like, wow, we can expect that from music. But, um, the reality is, is that we just, we just caught it in a lightning flash of, of something that only wasn't really meant to exist. Um, and it, it kind of, you know, corrupted the view of like what you do music for. Um, so I, I guess, in the long run, though, um, you know, all streaming sucks. All of it. Pay Spotify is not even the worst paying. I mean, Pandora and, and YouTube pay less. Um, and uh, um, at the end of the day, you know, honestly, the thing that had, you know, I just I don't see leaving platforms unless you leave all of them. And if you leave all of them, like it gets to the point where it's like, what are you providing for access to music? Like how much legwork are you going to put into that? So um you know i don't know man I, i'm just really at the point where um you know i think people need to stop looking at music as a product like it's not a commodity it's just a it's it's the advertising for you the performer and it, it's what sells you know you as the product or your your merch or your you know records or whatever but you know I, we're in a different era but isn't that's what that's what's happening right now we're literally seeing commodities traders well, it's still a commodity. It's just the, yeah. the commodity is been taken away completely from the artist. Well, and 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 I think the, but this is the thing that's going to grow in a recession-proof and uh, and economy is going to be licensing to music is going yeah. to in the state. Well, that's Jason. True. I was going to say something else. Um, I did all the reading that you sent me, and uh, it was really of chilling. Course. But one of the things that it's music is not even a commodity when you have hedge funds investing in um, an artist's book. It's actually a financial instrument. Like mm. it's become more abstract <coughs> than even a commodity. And that's what I just found so chilling about our present situation is that they financialized like a musical experience. They financialized our memories. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh yeah, and and even in the live world, right? Like, look at uh, you know uh, Live Nation. Um, you know, it, it was Clear Channel for a while. That's uh, what is it? Uh, what what's the, co the corporation that it? I heard no, Nation. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I don't I know. There's some there. Axis AX Super AXS, Corporation. AXS. It's all Super it's all cor- yeah, the the it's all uh, the all the ticket sellers, the concert promoters. They're it's all, all it's um, it's a big mob. <clears throat> but has, hasn't this been going on for a long time in who gets the money and who doesn't? Um Sam and Dave never really got a dime, the writers did. But would those songs be I mean they're great songs, but would they be as great? without them singing them. Uh, they were trying to get mechanicals for people for years and that never happened. So you saw a lot of the great performers wouldn't get any money even when their songs were being played 20, 30 times on regular radio. And, uh, you know, and there's people finding ways. I mean, I, I live in Highland Park. I work in Highland Park and a young lady up the street from my office uh, Billy Eilish seems to be figured out how to make a lot of money in the industry. So. <laughs> and there are folks to get through, right? I mean, like, look at look at that Lord song, right? Like, it's a good tune, but like, it, it got in. Like, and every once in a while, there are these freak events. But I want to tag something, and it's it's. I know it's hard. I don't want to dominate this conversation, but I'm kind of neutron, so I tend to. But Pasquale. I uh, brought up an incredible point about merchandise, right? I actively sell merchandise. I uh, thank you for pimping my shit, uh, Jason. Uh, we have a we have T-shirts and stuff, too. That I ha- I've been so overworked. I haven't even a chance to get those up. But that brings in a good amount of revenue. That brings in way more revenue than like selling music. So that said, I worked at Forrest, uh, my, uh, who's the host of Moving Extravaganza, the other show that I'm on that's uh, that I'm the co-host of, Forrest Miller. Uh, I, I just worked it out as a conversation much like this, but informally of what I had made on Spotify over the last four years. And let's let's be clear. Uh, I, I, it's not the, the music of Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends is not huge, but it's not nothing either. It's like tens of thousands of plays. Right. It's, it's kind of in that weird, like enough to get scraped for that N- NFT thing that I'm sure we're going to get into. But like not enough to uh, be like a household name or anything. I worked out that. In, I think it was four years of streaming through Spotify, through Tidal, all of the things, whatever. It worked out to an average day for Bandcamp Friday, which Bandcamp is a service where people can buy music directly from the artist and or label. And provide and, and in that way, provide direct support to the artist with no middlemen whatsoever. Bandcamp takes like an infinitesimal fee. And on the Fridays, first Fridays of the month, that was a, this is a pandemic thing. They stopped taking money on that day. So that was a day that incentivized people to buy music. Now, why is capitalism the answer to this? Because if you cannot tour like I cannot tour right now and like many, many other artists can, there's no other way to make money but on the goddamn Internet. So that's, uh, again, sorry, uh, I'll get down off the pulpit again. Let let me ask this question to to Adam, (laughs) you know, Adam, the, the resident OG of the panel. Adam comes from a time where, you know, record deals were a little different than they are today. There was no streaming. You, there was actual radio airplay. And this is something that was kind of making me a little upset when I saw all the people that, you know, Conan and, and Pasquale and I know personally, uh, artists that were whining about their Spotify royalties. My first thing was, bitch, you wasn't finna get played on the radio? No way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that bullshit that you put out there on Spotify because what nobody fucking with you. And in today's day and age of corporate <laughs> radio stations and playlists and not taking in uh, unsolicited material for fear of lawsuits, ain't nobody fucking with you on the radio. So, Adam, how do you look at? Spotify and and these streaming services because it might be a little different for someone like yourself unless you're one of those situations where you don't own the own the music. Well, I do own uh, uh, some music, and I actually have fought for decades to get uh, some of the rest of it back, and I don't own all of it. Uh, I come from the time where there. Uh, since you mentioned these time periods, it's really instructive. The usual corporate. Uh, uh, guidelines in a contract back, you know, at any time from the 70s through when I was in it in the 90s, the standard artist uh, royalty rate was after recoup 0.125 on the dollar. That was 12 and a half cents after recoup. 
Ooh. So that that was ending rapidly in the mid '90s when uh, no one was getting I and countless other uh, you know artists on whatever marginal levels in those times who were able to be uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, surviving for a while just dropped off and the phone ceased to ring and the gigs dried up. And then there was another period uh, that leads to the Spotify shit, and that was uh, a phenomenon trying to integrate people running from the old models of CDs and albums. Uh, and I have seven years of experience uh, on the inside of this phenomenon. It was called CD Baby, may still be. CD Baby was one uh, rich kid who was standing at the hemorrhage of the old music industry, and he profited uh, mightily from it. And uh, the, he was the first person that saw the flood uh, of uh, people at the end of the en uh, barrier to entry. Uh, the Derek old Sievers. industry, of course. Uh, what's that? Yes. Derek Sievers so is the was, guy's name. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that was 2002 to 2009. And people were uh, sending music from their parents' uh, laptops in their bedrooms. They were sending them from their former uh, successful major label releases that they you know, had in old, uh, now defunct record companies, or mostly stacks of fucking CDs in their band space or their apartment. And uh, so we, we process millions of those throughout millions of them. Uh, the untenability of that was present all the time, but uh, the hundreds of musicians who were dying to call themselves uh, members of an industry and say that they existed in an industry that didn't any longer exist, they went along with the Kool-Aid and, uh, you know, that uh, kept pushing people. Uh, people wanted to play live. And now the thing about it is if you, if you X a third of all the money that came in for music over a hundred years, the recording, it's even higher than that. I'm adding merch and giving merch a higher uh, index than it probably had, but live recorded music sold and merch, you take almost all of that away and then what you're looking at is people are having to go backwards in history. They're doing the opposite of what happened in the whole uh, period that Pascal talked about, where people were playing live as a way to promote their recorded music. And Conan, we're, ta we're all talking about it. It's all past, and it's 25 years and counting since Napster and that phenomenon was staring everyone in the face. And the point is, it's not limited to music. It's going to happen to everything. But from 0.125 on the dollar, you know what it is now. It's 0 0.0 motherfucking three and <laughs> heading inex inexorably to zero. And the good thing is that means we all get to play because we love it and nobody's kidding themselves anymore. And there's an infinite amount of a possibility of what to do with it now. Who love to compose or perform, those who are you know used to playing on the road, stuff like that. That's going to continue to happen somehow, uh, and it's a lovely thing. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the bands, the songwriting, the performance are also fading into history, not making any personal claim about the commitment, the love of music, the talent of any musicians. I'm just saying because we live in different times, you ain't going to create the same fucking music or musicians that those times had. It's like it's all balkanized now. It's completely balkanized. Well, let, no me, yeah. possibility. let me let me ask the this. The technocracy had a lot to do with that, too. The technocracy speeding through those years, not just the file sharing, but people becoming accustomed to music as wallpaper, uh, hearing music through a hole this big in the fucking phone. All of these phenomena occurred at a pace with musicians losing their moorings. And while they were losing it, the gangsters on top they fucking cashed out before any of these rock aristocrats <laughs> and they left all the debt with the last uh, aristocrats of the modern generation. Uh, sorry, it is uh, it is the Jays and the Beyonce's and the Taylor Swift's and some of these artists who make most of their money on uh, appearance fees and merch. Yep. They're mostly holding debt. I, and I, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to go back to that. It's not going to go back to that. And I think the good thing is we're all still here. We all can keep making music. We can continue attempting to monetize it if that's a way you think it's your only way. But you can keep playing, you can keep composing, you can keep doing the things that you never could do 
when you were an artist who was only composing a performance, you can fucking learn how to play music and share that, learn things you never did as an artist because artists aren't allowed to uh, stop and go sideways and backwards and teach and enjoy teaching and learning because uh, you're too busy uh, not deviating from your model as a solvent, hopefully artist. So there's all Wait, kinds of ask, possibilities. Can I ask you one thing? Okay. Like, how do you pay the rent then? How do you pay for your health insurance? Like you're talking well, about this really beautiful, um, utopic creative moment, but that's for like older people like us who've been working a long time. We have banked a certain amount of cultural capital and uh, everything else. But for a younger person, they can't afford. It's a they tough time. Healthcare. They can't afford their rent. They're just surviving. And how do you um, have a musical culture when people literally um, cannot make a living doing? doing their day job and um playing music, music at night and only the like rich trust fund kids can be musicians yeah. not because rich trust fund kids are a lot of the people that you hear on the goddamn radio yep <laughs> all, the, all that prohibition rock all the uh the popper hats and all that shit that's yeah. all trust fund rich shit. motherfuckers yeah, the metal scene want, is full of I want, to, I want to interject briefly, if, if you guys. I mean, I know all of you, except for Catherine, are professional musicians. But one of the things that I, I kind of want to caution I this kind of, not, okay, kidding. This conversation <laughs> is that, that we're talking about the really bad situation we have in terms of the rate of return that we're getting from musical artists, which is true. But I think that we are really creating a false narrative if we're painting what musicians had to go in go through in the past as some kind of halcyon days because one of my uh you know understandings and readings of of you know of music particularly in the areas of black pop culture and black music and not only black music but musicians in general is that quite frankly at the peak of the popularity of the music world in the 50s 60s 70s the industry was controlled controlled by organized crime and institutions that were always robbing musicians and it was the very few and far in between that were getting their uh, just return on investment for the work they were putting out in terms of the quality of music that they were putting they were putting into the market, and that the large normative history of even some of the best musical acts and talents that we've had in America as a society were people who basically died broke and were getting robbed by the people who were managing them and handling their money. So, and, and, I, I, and I do not deny that the current manifestation of how music is accessed and acquired is horrible but we're talking about an industry an industry where guys like you have been getting robbed since the beginning of the industry and, and that's a great point pascal because uh, you know i was bonding with jason over you know early punk rock but greg ginn never played paid those guys anything off their records yep. and there were lawsuits forever after that um, a lot of major label people got signed and had no idea that the David Fincher video for $3 million they were going to have to pay for, or the uh, album that they sent out to their mom they were going to get charged for. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's one of those things where it's a business that smart people have made money, and uh, a lot of people have a good time and uh, end up you know, working someplace else in their 30s. I, I, I want to ask this question to everybody, and, and, and even even Catherine, because you do bring up an interesting point about the class of people that are actually breaking breaking through. And there was an interesting article that Pascal had shared. Yes, Pascal, got, got to get the right pass right. <laughs> now had shared about the lack of younger artists in, in music. And when we talk about like the curation of music festivals, there's definitely younger new artists in it, and all of it's based yeah. on uh, social media, right? How many followers do they have on this platform? How many spins do they have on Spotify? Um, what's the magazine? I can't think of the name of the magazine that tells how many people come to see you play. Gives you the, the, the numbers for your tour dates. You know that magazine. Pass. Billboard. Or, I don't know, sorry, that's recording, maybe. There's a, it's called Skip. Think of the name of the magazine, but it'll show you the number that you get <clears throat> for every show. Stage Mom. No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I don't know, dude. I, I, I'm out of loop. I can't think of the name of the 
location off the top of my head, but uh, you know they're they're just going off off some of these these metrics to to book people. But ultimately, when you look at concert tour numbers and who's generating tons of revenue, it's older artists first and foremost. Yeah, I don't know if people know how music venues work, but food and beverage is a major part of music venues, and younger artists tend to bring out younger fans. Younger fans don't make that much money. They don't have any goddamn money. Exactly. That's <laughs> why Spades Coach used to make more than Coachella. Yep. Thank you. Well, and so now, my job doing the numbers for those festivals. And I can, the last year I was doing numbers for Coachella, it was the year after Beyonce. And I couldn't tell you who the headliner was. I don't remember. So look that up if people can. <laughs> Was that well, year, it, can we let me finish? There was a twenty okay. percent drop in revenue. Stagecoach broke records because they buy everything and they buy the food and they, they pay buy. for parking. They don't camp in the mud and they do the three sixty. Yeah, yeah, it's. Well, and so what I was just going to say to, to add on to that is that like things, services like Spotify reward things people already know. And it is a service designed to do that it is not a discovery service. When it is used as something like a discovery service, it is purely in service of the same sort of payola that, as I mentioned in the chat, like what Pascal was rightly talking about, they would have called that disruption now is what they would have called that, which is basically like shameless profiteering and uh, conscription to the point of practically slave labor for uh, what you're doing. But I think it's amazing that so many people don't realize that that culture culturally, we've been programmed not only to expect everything to be free, but to be rewarded for things we already know. I Meaning, if y'all got in, if you got in before the buzzer, you're good. Everyone else? And that's kind of what it is. And and like now that's it. I you know, I do know a lot of younger artists. Why? I still tour. I mean, not in the last year and a half, I haven't, but like I do know a lot of younger artists. So like a lot of my friend group even ends up trending younger because folks my age are like real busy, like buying houses and you know, having kids and such. Uh, but I think it's really interesting that we we hammer into the point of like Spotify and, and its ilk becoming a replacement for radio. Because radio is a tool of discovery. What made radio a good tool for discovery? You had that freak that had to tell you about, you got to hear this record. You got to hear, you know, you you have to hear this is the best thing ever. I'm going to play this like every hour until like everyone knows how great this band is. Well, you still have those those freaks, nerds and weirdos. But again, it's super hyper balkanized, meaning that you now are able to reach like, you know, 12 people as your social media will allow you to have it shown to if the algorithm deems it to be so. But other than that, that universal hearing the Beatles, uh, you know, sorry, seeing the Beatles on like, uh, on a, 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 was it Ed Sullivan? Right. Like we don't have those moments anymore. Like Nirvana live and loud. We don't have those moments. Anymore. No, those are not we have. No, we have 20,000 little moments that like reach small groups of people. Those those moments are dead. So I, I think there's always going to be some sort of counter to the popular narrative of music. There's always going to be subgenres. And this is my my opinion, and I want to know how you guys feel about this. I feel that because we are such slaves to these streaming services, we're also slaves to the algorithm that it, it gives our our internet. So if I like Icelandic death metal disco polka, <laughs> and there's Who and that that I think is big in that genre, and we all know that there's no real money in Icelandic death metal disco polka. But because I keep hearing this band and bands like it, now I'm creating the same type of music. And I've your own feedback loop exactly. of this yeah. shit that I can't get out of. And unlike years prior with terrestrial radio and with things like MTV and television being kind of a thing of the past. So talking about these cultural signifiers like fear on Saturday Night Live, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like rage Against the Machine getting banned from Saturday. Like all, all this stuff is a thing of the past. Motorhead on the young ones, you know? Like let's not be Americanized, it, you know? It, it, but yeah. <laughs> what does that do then for the way we look at music and then the powers that be, how do they want to view music? 
So Pasquale and I had a conversation some time ago. I, I will keep saying it slow, like I'm a little special because <laughs> I don't want to fuck it up. Um, where he had made a comment, he goes, and we had a long riff about this. He goes, hey, don't think that Fire Festival was an anomaly. Bless you. Bless you, Dr. Lou. I saw you. Um, Matt Wall, would you like to elaborate on that? Because I think the panel would love to chime in after you elaborate on this. Um, God, yeah. I mean, it's like the, that situation is bound to happen a lot now, um, mainly because, you know, we're looking at, to begin with, it, you have to be a, extraordinarily ambitious in your ideas of like how you put on a festival and what you're going to do. Um, and at the same time, you have to basically, I mean, you have to over promise like by default, people are going to drop off, things are going to work. And like, the thing is, is that people are just turning festivals and, and, and music a lot of the industry in general is like a big Ponzi scheme right now, you know, and it's, and it's like, they're, they're banking on making money now, um, you know, to fund themselves and then hoping for more when, you know, when the rubber hits the road and then, you know, hoping that that will cover their debts and everything that they've already dug themselves in with, um, deposits and things like that. And, and, you know, I mean, guarantees, you can't book these bands without at least half of the guarantee anymore. And, um, and so it's like, and it, it's just, that's like the business model now. And like, yes, live nation and, and iHeartRadio have the capital to just, you know, barrel through, but like, it, I think we're going to see a lot of that happening, um, in general. Um, I think, that's even small shows are getting to that point where people are like leveraging larger bands on the hopes of a bigger turnout. Um, granted now it's like, I don't even know what to say. It's COVID. So, um, I don't even know what that looks like from a promoter standpoint, but, um, Depressing. yeah, I mean, for <laughs> sure. But the problem is, is that like, it always, I mean, it always was, you are always were making a bet when you tried to organize something, but, in the past it was like you were set up to fail if you had to and now it's like they're just they're betting more than they have on everything and then it just it turns into you know we need to we need this to work so we can pay for what we've already spent and then we need the next one to work to pay for that and then it just turns you know i mean there's people making their profits at the at the corporate level but like a lot of these people are just it's just a farce you know it's just it's just let's see if we can do this and let's bring in some names it's like nobody has none of them have nobody has fucking money i mean we really don't like people are worth something yeah. they their their net worth is is something and they try to leverage that but like even the biggest artists like you know they're, they're, there's not a lot of liquid behind them i mean they're they're just i mean and this is like what capitalism has done to music um granted again like i've i've got a weird view of music in that i think the you know we're we're back in an era that was like the 50s really and you know as much as people have rose colored glasses about that era um, you know, it was just labels, you know, gluing songs to, you know, five kids and then sending them on the road and the kids don't make money on the songs. They just made money from showing up. And when they got done, they were, you know, broke and working at a factory or whatever. So, you know, it, it's at this point, I don't know, I, I guess I, I, and I don't really remember what my original point was with Firefest because it's been so well, we, we had a whole week. First of all, I think this might've been the night we talked to like four in the morning and we definitely. Yeah. A, another spin and i wanted to get with Catherine about this definitely is that uh, um we talked about that aspect which and we also talked about the aspect that there's a class basis to the way the music festivals are oh you, yeah you have to Absolutely. have a decent amount of money and one of the biggest uh dollar per head festivals is bottle rock in napa mm -hmm. it's it's, it's shocking, <laughs> right? <laughs> about thirty thousand people. Coachella is about one hundred twenty-two a day. EDC is about one hundred seventy-five thousand a day. 
which is, which is the biggest in America that I know of at the time that I was doing numbers for music festivals. But the dollar per head at Bottle Rock was very high. All older artists. Yeah, because it's all people fucking around with vineyards, as I say, as I drink some wine. That like that's what they're doing, right? Like that that's they're like, hey, here's my hobby. I like make I have my own wine label. Oh, isn't that nice? They don't have any real problems. Those are real bills, you know? But but what is interesting to me about the, the fire is that was a curated experience for a certain class of people. Yep. Could afford that ticket. And while I agree there's always gonna be rock shows, metal shows, and punk shows, and, and the like, Fire Festival was going to be, um, sorry, I'm getting a phone call, um, for the upper crust. Right. Right. The Kendall Roy's of the world. Yeah. Right, I think I described it as the like a, a, a curated, a curated music experience, like, like, uh, oh, what did I call it? Crap. It was like a bespoke concert. You know, it was, it was just like you, you walk into the tailor and get this, this concert made for you, you know, and all it, it's like, all, all all of these just, not just, not just bottle rock, but, um, Coachella is all their luxury items. Like the thing to do, but at Coachella is have a private plane fly you in from LA into Palm Springs. Then you have like your air conditioned, um, tent and, um, what really strikes me about what everyone is saying, the musicians here, is um, there's a general devaluation of the experience of music. But at the same time, there's an inflation of the musical experience as a luxury. And it's just so perverse. And I know that it's happened before and it's happening all the time. It's the most raw form of exploitation to take like the freshness and youth out of these five kids, <laughs> suck it dry and like throw them out on the street. And so there's something so raw about that. And um, um, I was thinking though about a question I have because I'm a critical theory nerd. You know, Theodore Adorno said like piped in music, elevator music, he said jazz because he thought jazz was all produced, but like produced music and its prevalence is the beginning of like totali the the demand for totalitarian compliance from the populace. Yeah, right. And that comes with devaluation of musical experience. Like when I go to this Tustin marketplace in Irvine, there is piped in music in the fucking parking lot. And I'm just oh, yeah. like, why? <laughs> why? And that to me is just it's the fact that we accept that. And they could be playing like David Bowie or Prince even very, very um, softly. And that softness is just about like making it ambient, making the music um, like wallpaper, like more and more music is just like wallpaper, decor or luxury item now. And what all of you are saying is that there's this general devaluation actually of the musician as yes. producer yeah. and musical experience, authentic musical experience, a total devaluation of it. And um, if, I feel like if we don't figure out how to change this, we can't figure out how to um, change any economic or political condition. If I may, if I if I may steal a line from a great man on this very show, say it louder for the people in the back. <laughs> uh, I hate to be the one who disagrees, but go, Bill. Um, go, go. Here's the thing. The pandemic has really kicked a lot of things in the teeth, whether it's small restaurants or venues or, you know, um, hopefully it kicked Live Nation in the teeth. But um, hmm. uh, that's my personal bugaboo. <laughs> but um, so I, 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 I have this other day job where I'm not making films. And I, uh, above my head, there's a, a venue called The Lodge Room. And it's about a 500 seater and it, it is it is a rich kid who owns it which is why he was able to stay open all the way through the pandemic he's opened a bit but i would come out to my office and uh you know i live in los angeles so everyone's always complaining about uh the un, you know the unhoused and i would see like 20 <laughs> young people who looked like they were unhoused and i'm like hey man you can't be against the wall here next to my office but um, because there was reasons for that. And they're like, why not? We're waiting for the show. 
and they would come up with some band that I had never heard of. Uh, one time it was like an industrial uh, jam band from like Cleveland, and they were lined up for like what is all the way down the street, and they were from all over the place. I'm like, really? And um, you know that that place was packed all the time, right up until the pandemic. And there are people making money playing music out there. It is a hard time, but, you know, I think when it comes back, I think a lot of people are going to be listening to music and going to uh, uh, shows that of bands that we haven't heard of and young bands. As far as making money on the radio, I'm not sure that ever happened anyway, like I said earlier. So at least not for a lot of people that I know, they didn't make a lot of money that way. So a very um, small number of people made money on the radio and it was for a very short amount of time. And I think the people that you hear bitch the most about it are the ones that can't pull that, that radio money like they used to and get those fat ass ASCAP and BMI checks like they used to, you know, let's be honest. There's some dudes. So some of us might even know them personally. They got some (laughs) fat ass publishing check. Uh, uh, back in the day, um, and it, it's that model is gone, and they're the ones that bitch the most about Spotify and shit. And that filters down to the younger artists, and it, it feels like younger artists are saying, "Well, if Trent Reznor is complaining about royalty rates, then I have a right to bitch too." Trent complains about everything. <laughs> <laughs> but but by that same token, a lot of artists, such as like Buzz Osborne, Steve Albini, uh, artists I like like and respect, and yes, no, are the first ones to say like, "Hey, you know, it, if people want to like listen to it for free, let them." Like that's the greatest discovery tool in the world. Like that's not something that we're we're counting on. That goes back to Pasquale's point uh, that you know it's been a lively discussion. So there's been there's been a lot happening. But I think that that's you know again. Part of the me, me relating the tale earlier of like talking about Sp- uh, Secret Friends Spotify royalties versus an average day on Bandcamp Friday, you know, four years versus one day, is that if you look at it like a replacement for radio algorithmic, though it may be, but as a discovery tool, then like it hurts less. It's not something where you're looking at it like, you know, it is still sharecropping. Let's be clear. Everyone's labor is being profited upon. But was music ever meant to be a profit center? Not really. There was this accidental historical time, not accidental. There was this historical time that it, w- that it was that way. And it's important to look at that from the longer scope of history, but also important to learn that Napster terrified everyone because they were like, hey, everyone's coming in and like stealing from the store is how they looked at it. <laughs> so what did that lead to? Right. That led to the iTunes store where now we're the ones selling you the music. And then there's like, oh, no, no, no. We're going to rent you the music. You're going to pay this fee to us. You don't actually own anything, right? But we're going to provide to you all of the stuff you ever could dream of and so much more. And it's the only product you'll ever need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they effectively train. Everyone is complicit in this, that uses these streaming services, because the tacit complicity of using them is so important to understand how they got one over that we have new and more exciting gatekeepers now. Well, let me ask the gatekeepers are gone. Gatekeepers are still there, man. It's there's, there's look a little different and they got an app now. That's all it is, man. Let me ask this question to the wacky panel and then it'll be the final question as we are approaching an hour. Thank you. First of all, thank all of you for returning my emails. And (laughs) so again, this is like, you know, having a local show and you ask all your friends to come out because you know ain't nobody really coming but that it's one fans on Monday. Boy. So <laughs> I want to thank all my divorcee friends that came <laughs> old and new. <laughs> that agreed Still married as far as I know, but yeah. Uh, uh, but being that there is not just a corporate capture of people buying rights to music. And of course, owning music and owning these platforms, I believe it's three major labels and one of the uh, licensing companies that is the that, that has a 68 or 70 percent of the music on Spotify. Um, also, and Bill, you probably know about this as well. There is a corporate capture, especially on the West Coast of buying small.
smaller music venues, really in smaller music venues. We were seeing it in San Francisco. I know you're seeing it in Southern California. And that's going to change the landscape of the way we see music as well. We also live in an era where everyone can be famous. When I was younger, if I liked a band a lot, like a really lot, maybe I was on a street team. That shit's dead because everybody can be a celebrity. I literally just watched uh, before I went on an interesting documentary that I've been meaning to give to the patrons for free. I'm going to give it to you because I finally figured out what my HBO password is. So you guys are going to get it for those that don't have HBO. Go for your patron. We'll put it up so you can watch it. It's called Fake Famous, where an experiment was done in L.A. where they actually got three people that had no social media presence, created fake social media presence for them so they could be Instagram celebrities. And it worked. It. They bought likes. They bought followers. They bought comments. Now, in the last, what did you say, 10 years or so, you've been able to do that in the music world, right? MySpace came along. You could buy fans or whatever the fuck it was called. Um, people are buying fake downloads on SoundCloud. Content farms in Ukraine. There, there's, there's crazy. <laughs> rows and rows of iPhones just streaming shit nobody cares about. Yeah. So in this, I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture of, of the probably a dystopian world, but it's just an overall view of where we are. And I'll start with Adam. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I loved hearing you all and being with you all. I just wanted to say uh, I never got a chance to respond to Catherine. Oh, so hopefully this was sorry, relates Adam. to that. You said <laughs> what has to happen. And uh, you can't just expect people, you know, to get money in there, like they say in Spinal Tap. And all I'm saying is, uh, it's just like life. Uh, musicians and uh, people across all strata and every facet of their life are facing uh, demoralization, frustration, and, uh, you know, like uh, dropping out of participation. And that has to start in, uh, from basics. People have to communicate based on, you know, some kind of agreed on uh, baseline sanity and we ain't there. So the things that apply to music totally apply economically and everything we're crying about and hopeful about in music is just the sound of what's all, you know, is gonna be happening in life soon because music is in front and we have a lot to do there, but uh, we may have to change the words, change the categories and change uh, the power of people and music. You have to change who we are if we're gonna make uh, music differently and we have to live in a different kind of society if we're not going to just sit there and cry that daddy is not being fair about how the pie is cut up because capitalism is exactly the same uh, across society and in music and for that whole time as pascal said it's always been that way so uh do it because you love it and fight for justice in it and yeah well i don't think any of us has any delusions about uh you know, the old myths, but uh, thanks for having me. I hope that said something about it. And I hope that said something to you, Catherine, about what you were talking about yeah. as far yes. as yes. what do people Absolutely. do now? But, but my final question is painting that picture. Bill, what is the future of music? Wow. Um, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> I, th I think the future of music is probably a lot like the past of music, to be honest with you. I think certain people will figure out ways to make money. Some people probably don't deserve money. There's probably going to be a lot of, you know, I watch these drill rappers and these, you know, they're all signing with Atlantic and they're basically not, they know they're going to get the money back by, you know, the kids spend it on nothing. And, and then there's going to be smart people like, uh, you know, I've been friends with REM for years, and first thing they did was uh, give publishing to all four members of the band, their lawyer and their manager, because they knew that's where the money was. And um, they didn't want to fight, and they didn't want to, you know, be angry at each other, and that's why they were around for a long time. A lot of other bands, you know, did stuff like that. But how people are going to make money... It's, unfortunately, right now, it's still going to be the people who figure out capitalism who are going to probably make the most money. Uh, it would be great if things were more fair, and I would love to see 
you know, certain artists that uh, had never got their due be rewarded with a whole bunch of money, you know, at the end. And I don't know if that uh, made any sense, but I, I always remember there's a, a thing um, that, and this goes back to something I knew from R.E.M. Um, back in, I think it was 85, they did a uh, album where they did a bunch of B cuts and put it out and they had three Velvet Underground songs on it. And uh, Lou Reed called up one of them, I forget, I think it was Pete, and said, I just want to thank you guys. I finally was able to buy a house because Lou Reed had worked as a typist in the early 70s for his dad and he had never made any money. And um, he probably, you know, that's one of the most influential bands ever. And I'm sure a lot of people made money because they, they aped him, including Jimmy Page. But you know, um, he didn't make any money. And near the end, he did make money. And so hopefully people like Lou Reed eventually make money. That's, I don't know if that's a bummer to say or what. <laughs> Rick Sims from the Digits bought a house when the Offspring covered one of the Digit songs on uh, that mm. first record of theirs. It's yeah, the only real money Rick Sims ever made. <laughs> it, it's the easiest way to give money. I, um, uh, I don't know if any of you guys know Keith Morris, but you know, he's always had health issues and uh, he's been on uh, Protonic. He's a, I'm a huge fan. Keith Morris, circle jerks, black flag, incredible dude. He, he went dude. down to Ray Pettibone's house. Ray Pettibone said, dude, I'll never give you money, but if you get sick, you can come down here and grab two paintings. So that, that is communitarian <laughs> effort right there. And that's the real power. Um, I think the future is bright. I just hope that, um, I just hope that music becomes again something that actually moves people, whether it's politically or, I mean, it has in the past actually made a difference. And I think it's probably the most underrated monopoly in the entire world because I don't know how people would get through life without music. And you go any place in the world and people are playing music and, you know, you can go other places in the world and they could care less about Facebook or uh, you know, whatever Jeff Bezos is doing. So, well, well, what? Romero, what do you think the future of music is? I mean, the old man. <laughs> we're, we're, I think we're kind of, I, I guess we've always been at a crossroads and I'm just waiting for that other lane to open up. But, you know, really, like the thing that will fix music is, is you know, that society at large stops requiring everyone to monetize every bit of their being in order to survive um i think that's that's the core you know that's what it is you know it, and you look in there are places in europe that are a little more forward thinking right now where you can just be a musician and live on on government stipends and stuff uh, in order to survive um you know it's not perfect but it's better than what we're doing um so i think that you know, if we can get to that point as a society, which is a much larger problem than the music industry itself, that would be awesome. People could just, you know, do what I do. I just do music for fun. I mean, I work a job, which I have to, I have to do, but, um, but you know, I want people to like at this point in my life and my career, like I love that I can just make music and I, and I want people to get it for free. I don't want them to pay me for it. I don't, care how they get it. i don't care if they're on spotify I don't, it, it, whatever just listen to it enjoy it um you know please like you know let me know if you like it but i don't um I, that's the world i want to live in where musicians can just be like i'm just living my life and i'm just making music and if people like it that's awesome if not i'm not going homeless and and to me that's that's the biggest thing um otherwise you know music's going to become the next nft and and you know someone's going to turn it into you know what these these hedge funds are trying to do with it and and you know that that's a horrible outcome but um you know i'm hope i'm i try to be optimistic i still love making it so so i i, I go that route and conan you'll have to be brief because i have to get into the bonus patrons only after hours are you going to be joining us from the bonus patron only after hours hey, sure yeah i would love to um so Okay, so I'm in what is known as the upper lower class, like lower middle class of like working bands. And the fact that I, I do want people to buy 
the music when possible, but it's not the most important thing. Hearing is most important. Going back to one of your more original points of the essay mm -hmm. is people are more concerned about the uh, you know making musical cues for commercials and things like that rather than making the great album. I make records. And I make them for what is an infinitesimally small audience, if you think back to like the 90s and the Halcyon days or whatever, but a dedicated audience. It means a whole lot to a small amount of people, as opposed to mm -hmm. meaning nearly nothing for a gigantic audience. So I'm yeah. fine with that. This is my lot in life. This is what I've chosen to do with my life. I dare say I'm pretty, pretty good at it. And uh, there's a world for it. So that said, going back to the conceit, of, and I said when I promoted the show that I was going to give a little bit of hope because I think stuff's rough right now, especially like, you know, with this whole like, hey, you're on Rogan's side or you're on Neil Young's side. And it's way more nuanced than that. Way longer than we have time to even discuss right now, clearly. But I will say that you have the ability to give direct support to artists you love right now through uh, the only musical service that I can think of that is founded in fairness, which I heard from Chris Murphy of Sloan when I had him on. But it's also an R.A.M. thing. Uh, R.A.M. Sloan Fugazi, very uh, rare uh, echelon of bands that uh, were communitarian and uh, splitting equal shares, so on and so on. And I think that the thing that we need to remember is we have the ability to change things by choice and not be complicit in this horrible sharecropping that goes on. This horrible music is not just commodity, but devalued to the point that, as Catherine was saying, it's like being played at the parking lot of the grocery store and robbed of all its power until it's faded away into a gray, thin gruel. We have that power right now, and you can change it right now, and you probably should. <laughs> stunned, stunned in silence. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I just want to say one thing. Sorry. <laughs> go, go, Catherine. Um... <laughs> There's a little, there's a hip hop group out of Chengdu, China, which is this tiny, this huge city in a very remote area. They're called the Higher Brothers and they feel it, man. You can find it. You can find them on YouTube. And my son turned me on to them. Music really does reach people in, and um, create these new um, experiences for people. And uh, it's not that I don't have hope. And I do think that we need more social support for musicians, but there is musical experience and there are frontiers of musical experience where the for music has not been fully commodified by uh, the U.S. imperial culture industry. So um, I just want to put a shout out to Mandarin hip hop group Higher Brothers out of Chengdu, China. So. You are always okay. repping the PRC. I'm always repping the PRC. Yep, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you do yeah, it, They right? say there's so much censorship there, but why is there this hip-hop group that's really successful people? So, so what Catherine just did, who has a platform, right, is this is what all of us need to do, and this is what Jell Biafra talked about, become the media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do here, Conan. Is oh, I, I know. I know you are. And you and you have done a fantastic job of it, my friend. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank Pascal for not falling asleep. You're not happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I paraphrased your signature line. I just wanted to get it in while I still had a chance. It's all right, man. It's not a problem. <laughs> Great. And for for Thanks, folks. Joining us, Bill, are you going to be joining us in the bonus uh, champagne room? Sure, I'd love to. Adam? If you'll have Oh, uh, I've had my excitement for the night. I've got to go have some uh, vegan milk and get put to bed or taken for a walk. But uh, you all have a great one. Well, Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate uh, joining listening you. to you all. And uh, keep playing music. Well, I'm going to keep making music for five people that want to hear uh Black dude yell and scream about a bunch of bullshit, and sometimes make smooth instrumentals. You're you're gonna per, you're gonna play though. You're gonna per, you're gonna be rocking or you all are continue talking. He, he he's he's he does both. Any measure. As, as right now, I'm sitting in the bedroom making a bunch of music uh, because I have to. 
but uh, ultimately, I would love to perform again. But this show takes up so much of my time, and I love doing it. And I love doing it with my lovely co-host. Lovely. Yes, lovely. <laughs> you are you're lovely. Uh, I mean, podcasts I are the new too. punk rock. Podcasts are the new punk rock. Podcasts are the new punk rock? Wow. I got to really process that. <laughs> yeah. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Punk rock is rebellious. And we are out.